Greetings, family. My name is Dutum Kize, and I'm one of the children workers here at Christchurch Midland. Welcome to Church at Home this morning. And if it is your first time, a very warm welcome to you. We are glad that you could join us this morning. We thank God for this day that he has made for us to come and worship him in songs, in prayer, and to hear from his word. So won't you bow your heads with me as we pray together this morning. Lord, we come before you with thanksgiving in our hearts this morning. We praise your holy name for you are good and your love endures forever. Thank you that we can meet from our different homes to hear from your word and give praises to you. For you alone deserve all the praise and honor and glory. So we commit this day to you, O oh Lord, and we pray that all we do today may bring glory to your name. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning, church family. I hope you're having a wonderful, wonderful Sunday morning from the comfort of your homes or wherever you're catching us from. My name is Kenzani Maringa and I am one of the leaders in Style.com. Style.com is um, a young adult's life group that we have here in church. And today I am going to be leading you in prayer. Praise the Lord my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name, praise the Lord my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives your sins and heals your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As far as, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And this is the word of God. Let us bow our heads and our will lead us in prayer. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, it is a privilege and honor to be called your sons and daughters and to be joined as with your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for giving up your life for us on the cross. Thank you for being our atonement and for reconciling us back to the Father when we were buried in sin and in darkness. We were deserving of the cross and God's wrath, but you bore the pain and shame for us. Thank you for the gift of life, life that you have given us in full. We thank you for all of life's provisions, from the food that we eat, availability of clean water, a roof over our heads, people we can easily reach out to, a loving church family, and all the big and little things that we tend to take for granted on our daily lives. We thank you for yet another day to come together on a Sunday morning like this in, from our respective homes. We are grateful for technology that helps us to stay connected and for us to get access to your word every Sunday. We pray for continuous strength and peace for those people who are affected or infected by the pandemic. Lord, may you uplift them and give them hope. May we hold on to the truth that you are forever in control. And we thank you, O Lord, for the Lordship, for your Lordship in our lives. May the opening of more economic sectors be a new dawn for people. And Father, may you continue to give wisdom to all people in leadership, from parliament leadership to business owners and to all forms of household leadership as well. Help us, Lord not only to be listeners of your word as it is about to be shared uh, this morning, but may we also put it into action. May your word challenge those who do not know you to heed to the calling of salvation. And may we also make it our mandate for being disciples that make more disciples. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. church family i'm michelle mari and i am 27 years old i'm a member of christ church midrand and i am also part of the teens ministry here at the church as you know august is women's month and the church has been shining a particular spotlight on various women in our church community so this platform is an opportunity for us to hear the voices of the women in our church, to get to know them um, on a personal level and ultimately to encourage and uplift one another with our words and with our stories. So this morning, I'm going to be interviewing Maggie van der Bult. Hello, Maggie. How are you? Hello, Michelle. I'm very well, thank you. And how are you? I am good, thank you. Thank you so Great much stuff. for and being a part of this. Such a pleasure. And hello to, to our church family, from me too. 
<laughs> okay, uh, so Maggie, would you tell everyone about yourself, who you are, what you do, and how long you've been at CCM? Okay, so I am a freelance journalist. I've been a Christian since the age of 13 and a member of Christchurch Midrand for about 20 years. And I'm a facilitator of our divorce care support group. Great. Okay, so in light of the Colossians theme that the church is going through at the moment, um, the theme being that Jesus Christ is enough, please tell us, um, was there ever a time where Christ was not enough or seemingly not enough in your life? And if so, how did you come to realize that he was? Well, I was converted on a school camp and I've always believed in the gospel that Christ died on the cross for my sins. Although at that time, I never understood the power of the gospel in my life. I was never ashamed of the gospel and could talk freely about my faith to anyone who asked. But after I was born again, I had very little further teaching. Although my parents believed in God, they weren't churchgoers. And so I was pretty much left to my own devices and my very limited understanding of what it means to be a Christian. So when my friends started talking about star signs when I was about 16, I saw nothing wrong with being caught up in what became a favorite topic of conversation. It was only when in, in a discussion with some friends over what star sign would make the ideal husbands for us that someone new to the group said, but Maggie, aren't you a Christian? Well, it hit me like a bucket of cold water. I realized that looking to star signs was in effect a denial that Christ was enough to direct my life. So I got rid of the book and I vowed to change. That's great. Thank you, Maggie. And so then um, how has your life changed or how did it change uh, when you then lived knowing that Christ was sufficient? Well, what I discovered was that change doesn't just happen on its own. You need the support of church and, and, um, and Christian people. So I've always been surrounded by non-Christian friends. Most believed in God, but weren't actually Christians. I believed I could show my faith by example, by living a life as a so-called good person and hopefully influence others to follow Jesus that way. But I never took the time to personally learn more about what it means to be a Christian. That was the case right through university and it took me another several years before I married and finally started attending, attending church regularly. I was very happy in my church until a friend invited me here to Christ Church Midrand where there were actual Bibles in the church pews instead of hymn books. It was only then with proper Bible-based teaching that I truly began to understand what the Christian life is really about. Okay, and then after that, how did you come to learn that Christ was sufficient? Well, my marriage turned out to be a very difficult one, unsurprisingly, because I had ignored some serious warning signs. But God is good because that slowly taught me that Christ was not only sufficient, he was everything. The worse my marriage became, the more I leaned into Christ. And I can honestly say that if it wasn't for him, I don't know how I would have survived. But I had taken my marriage vows very seriously. And I believe that so long as I managed to stay married until I died, I would have fulfilled my purpose on this earth. Gradually, with the wonderful counseling I received from the church, and I will hold that precious to me for the rest of my life. After 20 years in an increasingly untenable situation, I was eventually able to see that God would not abandon me if I got divorced. By God's grace, the church had just started out with its support groups, and I attended the first of the divorce care sessions. It was so good that I repeated the course several times and eventually ended up facilitating it. That is really great. Praise God for showing <laughs> up for us in some of the worst circumstances of our lives. For sure. So now, Maggie, was that uh, the end of your struggles for you as a Christian? <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> by no means. <laughs> My ex-husband was still very much in my life because I had made the decision to live on the plot next door to him for the sake of my children. There were some very strange things happening in his house and I wasn't going to do the conventional thing of moving away, 
much as I wanted to. And dispatching the children to stay there every second weekend or over the holidays. This way they could come and, they, as, and go as they pleased and I could keep a watchful eye over them. There's no question in my mind that I was living under the shelter of God's wings during those days. But it doesn't end there. Four years later, my ex-husband was murdered and then followed several extremely difficult years as my children and I navigated a contested will amidst the threat that his death was caused by people very close to the family. I feared for my children and my knee-jerk reaction was to quickly move to a security state in Centurion. I became afraid to travel at night and handed the divorce care reins over to a fellow facilitator. I became so embroiled in the circumstances that began, that, like, you know, that really overtook my life and I began to neglect church and to rely on my own strength again instead of Jesus. Not only that, but I ended up failing in an important aspect of what I had been teaching during divorce care. I gradually fell into a deep pit of guilt and I stopped attending church altogether. But I missed church terribly and I finally came back and unburdened myself. I was received with such grace. Martin reminded me of what he so often tells us, the church is not a country club for the righteous, but a hospital for sinners like you and me. Back in church, I spent time immersing myself in my spiritual growth and began facilitating divorce care again. But now, <laughs> with much deeper insight into the pitfalls that await people after divorce, God is really good. He truly does turn everything to the good of those who love him and who are called to his purpose. Amen. Amen to that. So Maggie, um, last question then. I would like to ask you, uh, what piece of advice would you have for me and for our fellow Christian sisters listening to this interview? Well, given my history, I have a few. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, never put anyone or anything before Jesus. No man will ever love you like Jesus loves you. So get Christian counseling before you make the decision to get married. And then make sure you stay in church and surround yourself by with Christian people. And remember that no matter what mistakes you may make, God is always ready to forgive you. You may not feel good enough, but because of what Jesus did on the cross, God says you are, and he'll always have a place for you to serve in his kingdom. Maggie, thank you so, so much. It's been such a pleasure to hear your story and we really appreciate it. It's a great pleasure. I won't, it's not always a pleasure, but <laughs> to repeat all my mistakes, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's, been <laughs> but it's been good. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks for, for your time. I've really enjoyed getting to know you a little. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, church family. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Greetings once again, family. I hope you enjoyed your time of singing praises to God this morning. I have some couple of family news to bring to our attention. The first one is Sunday Night Live. Sunday Night Live currently is busy with a series called Imbogoto. So this is a time where we listen to the stories of women on how God has been working in their lives. And we'll have a look at Luke's gospel to see how Jesus interacted with women. So we we'll start at 6 p.m. tonight on Zoom and the login details are on the screen below. The second one is Teens Food Collection Drive. So the Teens Ministry is doing a Teens Collection Drive to help those teens who are less fortunate in Tembisa. So teens are encouraged to collect non-perishable food and drop it off at Christchurch Midrand by the soccer field on the 5th of September from 10 a.m. till 12 p.m. 
DK Lady and Refilwe will be waiting to collect your food parcels there. And also, teens, you are also encouraged to include a verse or any encouraging message uh, to a person who will be receiving your food parcel. And the third one is family devotion on Colossians. Parents, you are reminded to log in or to check out on the website, our church website, check the family devotions from the kids at home page and enjoy those devotions with your family. The fourth one is Women's Power Hour. All the women are invited to join this great event. So this will be a great time of meeting together under God's word. And the topic for the day is what happens when Ruth and Esther meet COVID. So this is such an interesting topic and you wouldn't want to miss out. Kate will be teaching us uh, on the day. So come and join us and enjoy our time together. So this is happening on the 5th of September from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. on Zoom. See the details on the screen below. And the last one, it's a quick reminder for Crossroads. Crossroads, it's grade six and seven boys and girls. You are reminded that you are starting again next week on the 29th of September on Zoom. We meet at nine till 10 a.m. We are looking forward to meet you once again. And parents, please, please um, have a look on the website. Uh, all the details are there and register your kids. Thank you once again for your continuous generous giving towards God's work here at Christ Church Midland. We would like to encourage you to continue doing so in order for God's work to grow. You can do that through EFT or Snapscan. See the details on the screen below. Enjoy the rest of the service and God bless.
Now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I've become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known the gen- to make known among the Gentiles the glorious righteous of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full righteous of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This is the word of God. As a minister, every now and then you bump into a passage of scripture that makes you stop in your tracks and go, what are we doing? What are we actually doing as a church? This is one of those passages. There are two parts to it. In verses 24 to 29, Paul is describing the principles of ministry in general. And then in chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, he's applying those principles to the local church at Colossae. Immediately you might say, well, that's nice, that's Paul's ministry, but what does any of that have to do with me? It's a great question. He was an apostle, and he was used by the Spirit of God in unique ways at a unique time in salvation history. It was a unique time in the sense that the Spirit of God was busy founding the church on the Word of God. So I don't know about you, but nothing I write down is inspired and makes it into the Bible. Hasn't happened yet. Our actions and words are not validated by miracles and signs and wonders like they were for the apostles who were founding the church on the word of God. Ministry today is different, but it's also the same. It's also the same. And everything we read in this passage still applies today. How do we know? Well, because you find Paul elsewhere in the New Testament calling on his church leaders, calling on Titus and Timothy and the Ephesian elders to do exactly the same things that we find in this passage. So this passage is about ordinary ministry in the local church. Does that mean it's for pastors? And the rest of us can switch over to Netflix now. Sorry, but no. Because as the Bible makes so clear, and as our Reformed tradition makes so clear, ministry is for every Christian. Every Christian is a minister. We affirm, because the Bible teaches and the Reformers reminded us, we affirm the ministry of all believers. Ministry is not for gurus. Christian ministry is not for those who draw a church salary or for those who've been to Bible college. Every single Christian Every single one of us is a minister. So then if this passage is about ministry, it has to be for all of us. This passage tells us the business of the church. What is the business of the church? What are we supposed to be doing? We're about to find out. I can see seven marks of local church ministry in this passage of scripture. I'm sure there are more but seven jump out at us. So there's the calling, the cost, the center, the method, the goal, the means, and the reason. I know some of you take notes, so let me just run through that again. The calling, the cost, the center, the method, the goal, the means, and the reason. The calling. The call to ministry is a call to service. In fact, it's even stronger than that. It's a call to servanthood. Not just a call to service, a call to servanthood. 
So it's not just a call to do something. It's a call to be something. You know, I can bang on the piano, but that doesn't make me a pianist. You see the difference? It's a world of difference. I'm not just called to service. I'm called to servanthood. Look at chapter 1, verse 23. Paul describes himself as a minister of the gospel. In verse 25, he describes himself as a minister of the church. That word minister doesn't mean pastor or rector or church leader. It means servant. Now, you wouldn't think so when you think of some of our cabinet ministers or even some of our church ministers. But that's actually what it means. A minister is a servant. At the end of verse 24, Paul is talking about the church and he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for the church, of which I have become a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. In other words, I became a servant of the church according to God's plans and purposes. It was God's plan that I become a servant of the gospel and of the church. The Apostle Paul understands himself to be a servant by the will of God. It's not quite like that with today's apostles, is it? And it's so interesting. Today's church leaders are very interested in titles. We love titles, especially here in Africa. It's so telling which titles we choose. It tells you so much about what we think of the church, what we think the church is for, and what our role in the church is. Which titles do we choose? Man of God, prophet, reverend doctor, professor, major one. Did you notice that no one is queuing up for the title servant? No one wants to be known as a servant of anything, let alone the church. I mean, that is not the message you're trying to convey. That's not the brand you're trying to build. Today's apostles exist to be served, not to serve. If you call yourself servant, it's really confusing your brand. It's just not the image you're going for. What about you and me? If church is for everyone... If ministry is for everyone and not just the paid staff, do you think of yourself as a servant? We say time and time again, in Christ, we are a redeemed family of servants. Well, is that how you think of yourself as a servant? Is that how you live out your involvement in this local church? Are you a servant? Do you exist for others? Or, what's the alternative? You've heard me say this before. Are you a consumer? Does the church exist for you? We are so trained to think and live as consumers. It's actually so ingrained in us. It comes so naturally. You know, I see it. I see it play out when people come to me and they say things like, the church needs to offer more for kids, or the church needs to write better material, or the church needs to do X, Y, Z. And what I need to remind them in that moment, what I sometimes do uh, when, when I'm brave enough, is you are the church. That's what I should be saying. You know, the church needs to do this. What, but who's the church? You are the church. And right now, you're acting like a consumer. A consumer says, I've paid my tithe, and so this church must meet, meet my needs, or I'm going to go elsewhere. I'm going to vote with my feet. You know, the market for churches is very competitive. I don't need to be here. A servant sees that same gap, that same hole, and trust me, there are many holes. I'm not denying that for one second. But a servant sees that same gap in the kids' ministry, for instance, and says, well, here's an opportunity for me to love the family and to contribute to the kids' ministry. I'm going to fill that gap. Do you see the difference in mindset? It sounds small, but when that penny drops, it's a radical change in your life. 
and a change, a radical change in the lives of those around you. It's a radical change in our church. Contrary to popular belief, church is not a Sunday service provider. You know, people think of the church, that's the place where you get your kid baptized, you get your wedding sorted out, uh, you, they'll, they'll organize your burial, and uh, you can get your docs certified. That's kind of what the church is there for. On the contrary, church is an opportunity for you to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and to love others. Now, during lockdown, that has its own challenges, but it's not impossible. Remember back to each one, reach one. If you've fallen off that wagon, forget about it. Just jump back on. And this week, why don't you call just three people, three phone calls. Call someone up. Find out how they're going. How are you doing? What are you struggling with? Let them know that you love them. You don't have to say it in so many words. For some of, that's, for, for some of us, that's tough. But just the fact that you call them will demonstrate it and remind them that Jesus loves them and those words you do have to say and just encourage them to keep going. And if you do that, you will be living out your identity as a servant. Such a simple thing to do. Firstly, ministry is a call to service. Secondly, ministry comes with a cost. In verse 24, Paul talks about suffering for the sake of the church. He talks about toiling and struggling in verse 29 and in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, he says to the Colossians, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. When Paul uses words like these to describe his ministry, he's not talking about the difficult youth pastor. And he's not talking about the church water bill. I'm sure those things were on his radar. But we get a better sense of what he's actually talking about when we read his letter to the Corinthians. And he's in this part of the letter, he's writing against those who are trying to discredit his service. And this is what he writes. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I'm talking like a madman. I'm a better one with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, Danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And here he builds to a climax. And apart from these other things, there is the daily pressure, the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Ministry comes with a cost. Now, I'm not suggesting that we need to be the Apostle Paul. I don't even think he's suggesting that. But what I think he would insist on is that ministry involves struggling and suffering. It's not that we look for it. It's that it comes part of the package deal. Now, you and I are not being flogged. We're not being beaten with rods. But is there any cost to your involvement with this church? Because ministry comes with a cost. If there's no cost, there's no ministry. By its very nature, service of others is a denial of self. What you give to others, you're taking from yourself. So no cost, no ministry. What is your ministry costing you? What price do you put on the service of others? What is your threshold? What's the limit? Will you go as far as convenience allows, but no further? As far as your other activities allow, and no further? Would you describe your involvement in the church, the Christchurch family, as a labor and a toil? Are you laboring and toiling and struggling struggling for the family and for the gospel? I know that many of you are. Many of you are. And it is such a joy for me to partner in the gospel with you. You know, you are, you are such a challenge to me. You're such an encouragement to me. You're such a model to me in, in your zeal for the gospel, in your, in your struggle, in your labor to make the gospel known. But there are others of us, and perhaps this is you, who can't think of any cost to your ministry. And perhaps this is 
an opportunity just to stop and reflect and repent and to change. You don't have to fall into the depths of despair. Just take that regret to the Lord Jesus and ask him to change you. There's another danger. The one danger is no cost and therefore no ministry. The other danger is all cost, but still no ministry. There are some who labor and toil and struggle. You work yourselves to the bone for this church. But it's still not Christian ministry. What do I mean by that? It's still not done for the love of God and for the love of others. How can you know the difference? What's the test? Well, one test is in verse 24. I rejoice in my sufferings for the church. I rejoice. If you are laboring and toiling and struggling to earn your place in the family, to elevate your place in the family, or to win the recognition of others in the family, well, that's not ministry. That's religion. Only genuine ministry, genuine service can give you joy. Religion might give you the buzz that comes with a sense of achieve, achievement, the sense that you've earned the attention of, of others around you and of God. But only true ministry can give you true joy. When you work hard religiously, you are going to expect acknowledgement. And if it doesn't come, if you don't get it, you're going to be angry or bitter. It's another sign. You certainly won't expect to suffer for your service, suffering on top of your service. If you do suffer, the best that religion can offer you is some sort of stoic sense of detachment. You just need to grit your teeth and bear it. It's grim determination. Just get through it. But Christian ministry can give you true joy even in your suffering. Not by pretending the suffering isn't there, but by knowing that it is achieving an eternal good. Now, ministry acknowledges this work is hard, this is tough, but there are great things underway, and the best is still to come. The Lord has promised to use even this painful service for good. Even if I can't see any evidence of it right now, he's promised to use it for good, and I know I can trust him. A consumer is in and out, right? Keep your hands clean, get your spiritual top up for the week, onto the real business of life. A minister knows there's a cost, gladly accepts the cost for the joy set before her. A minister is a cheerful giver whose ministry is not fueled by acknowledgements or accolades or thank yous or honors, but by joy. Joy. Where does that joy come from? We'll say more on that in just a moment. But for now, ministry is a calling. Ministry comes with a cost. Third, ministry has a center. It has a center. Chapter 1, verse 25, read with me. Paul's task is to make the word of God fully known. The mystery, hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you the hope of glory. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knitted together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. At the center of church business is a mystery, a profound mystery, that mystery is Christ himself. In Christ is our hope of glory. In Christ is all wisdom and knowledge. Now, what, is, what does it mean to say that Christ is a mystery? A mystery hidden for ages past. I mean, that's a reference to God's dealings with his people recorded for us in the Old Testament. The great mystery is how this holy God can be true to himself and live in the midst of this sinful, wicked, rebellious people? How can he dwell with a mankind who have disowned him and disgraced him and constantly do so? 
over the centuries, he slowly reveals what his plan for mankind is. And that plan is revealed in its fullness in Jesus Christ. The mystery hidden for generations and ages past is unveiled in Christ. God solves the problem of God and man by becoming a man as God. Jesus holds the two, the two that should not be able to be reconciled. He holds the two together in himself. He is the saving ruling center of God's plan for all of history, and he is the saving ruling center of church and of the business of church. Ministry has a center. Jesus Christ is that center. We do a lot of good things at Christ Church Midrand. And that's not to say that we do them well. It's just to say that they are worthy pursuits. They are good things, whether we do them well or not. So we are involved in education, in caring for the poor, in racial reconciliation, in caring for those who have suffered grief or divorce or addiction. And soon, God willing, we will be involved in a formal way in caring for women and children who are the survivors of abuse. Those are good things. They're profoundly good things. But none of them is at the center of our ministry, nor should it be. The center belongs to a person. The moment we give the center to someone or something else, may the Lord shut us down. That is my sincere prayer. The moment we give it away, may, may he use all those wonderful facilities on the corner of 9th and 11th. I'm standing in them right now. May he use it all for something else. A judo hall, five-a-side soccer facility, a builder's warehouse, a nursery, you name it. Point is, may all of those facilities be anything but church. Because we will not be worthy of the name if Jesus Christ is not at the center. Of course, if he is at the center, which is his only rightful place, we will keep doing all of those things and we will do them better and we will do them for longer because they will be motivated by love for the king and love for his people. God's plan for all of history is to put Jesus at the center. It's a wonderful plan. It has wonderful blessings. Two of those blessings are listed for us right here in our passage. The first is the hope of glory. Glory is a big, hairy, theological word. It carries a lot of freight. Basically, glory is the godness of God. Glory is the godness of God revealed to mankind. For a human being to encounter God's glory is to experience God in all his mind-blowing, heart-wrenching, soul-satisfying beauty and perfection. That's an encounter with glory. And in Christ, that is our hope. Remember, biblical hope is not about your dreams or ambitions. Biblical hope is a reality. It's just a future reality. In Christ, God is inviting us into his glory. God's glory is our certain future. So whatever our struggles or our sufferings in ministry now, whatever the cost of being a servant, we can face all of that cheerfully, joyfully, because we know where we're headed. See how this works? A.W. Tozer said, The glory of God always comes at the sacrifice of self. In other words, we experience God's glory through service. Andrew Murray says it this way, humility is nothing but the disappearance of the self in the vision that God is all. God's glory through service in Christ. The center of ministry is Jesus himself, and he makes the cost of ministry something we can bear with joy. Gets even better. The blessings of being in Christ are not limited to the future. Chapter 2 verse 3 speaks about Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, wisdom is the truth of Christ applied to everyday life. Not only is Jesus at the center of the meaning of life, you know, kind of the big grand narrative, but he's also the center of your everyday grind, your nine to five. He's literally a treasure chest, a vault. The word is thesaurus. With 
all, so he's this treasure chest with all that you need to live a life pleasing to God in the here and now as you hope for glory. So God answers the question, what is the purpose of my life? You know, that big overarching question. But he also answers the question, what am I supposed to do with this annoying colleague? You know, the one with the B.O. who doesn't know how to respect your personal space and keeps taking your credit. What am I supposed to do with him? The answer, the center of the answer to both of those questions, the enormous kind of meaning of life question and the trivial question of the mundane details of our lives, the answer at the center of both is Jesus Christ. In ministry, we can make the mistake of making it one or the other, right? So either Jesus is only the hope of glory, so he's a ticket to heaven and this life is just a waiting room, or Jesus is only the key to wisdom. So he's a ticket to my best life now and whatever follows, follows. The only way to remedy that imbalance is to keep him at the center of everything because that's where he actually is. We're soldiering on. Fourth mark of ministry, method. If Jesus is at the center of everything, what should the church be doing? What should, we, what should we be busy with? What's our core business, right? What, what's our core business? Good question. Chapter 1, verse 28. Him we proclaim. We proclaim him. We tell people about Jesus. We don't have to put him at the center. He's already there. We just have to tell other people. And then we have to remind each other. Read on in verse 28, proclaiming him will involve warning. Now, warning has gone out of fashion. Warning is offensive and offense is the unforgivable sin in our culture. Heaven forbid that you give anyone offense. But if Jesus is at the center and you are living as though he's not, wouldn't you want someone to risk offending you so that they could warn you? If Jesus is the only way back to God and you missed it because warning is not polite in our culture, how would you feel? So in ministry, we, pro we proclaim Jesus and that means we warn people. When last did you warn someone? Out of love, not out of some sort of dry of pry self-righteousness, but out of love with tears in your eyes or in your heart. When last did you warn someone? Read on in verse 28. Proclaiming Jesus also means that we teach everyone with all wisdom. There it is again, that wisdom word. Now, this is not dry orthodox truth. This is the truth that Jesus is at the center, applied to every aspect of everyday life. We proclaim Jesus. That's the core business of the church. That's our method. Fifth mark of ministry is the goal. What's the goal of ministry? What are we hoping to achieve? Verse 28 again, him we proclaim, warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom. Why, Paul? What's the end? What's the end goal? That we may present everyone mature in Christ. The goal is maturity in Christ. Some translations say perfection. Neither word quite nails, nails it in the English. The goal is total undivided devotion to Christ. That's the goal of ministry. Conversion, as wonderful as that is, as much as we must pursue that, is not the goal. Devotion in every area of life is the goal. Now, maturity, it's hard to define, isn't it? But we know it when we see it. We know it when we see it. A mature Christian is a disciple who makes disciples. They are so devoted to Christ that you can see all the marks of ministry that we've just been talking about. You can see all of the marks of ministry all over them. They are servant-hearted. They are joyful in their service. They're not doing it to win the favor of men. They're doing it out of love for the Lord and for his people. Jesus is at the very center of their being. You can see it in the way they make difficult decisions, in the way they handle conflict or being insulted or being snubbed or being overlooked, in the way they handle real setbacks in life. You can just see Jesus right at the core of their being. The way they treat people of different standings in society. All of it so easily and obviously traceable back to Jesus at the center. And they proclaim him. 
They proclaim him. They want others to know this Jesus and to grow in their devotion to him. Nothing gets them more excited. Do you see it? I mean, I have faces in mind. Faces of people in our family, our church family. You know devotion to Jesus when you see it. You know them. You have faces in mind. You know them. You look up to them. That's what I'm talking about. That's the goal. That's where you're headed. That's maturity. That's, that's what God wants for your life. It's not necessarily, we obsess about what is God's plan for my life? Is it this career? This, you know, must I live in this neighborhood? What he wants for your life is maturity, undivided devotion to Christ. Sinclair Ferguson asks, how do we bring glory to God? He continues, the Bible's short answer is by growing more and more like Jesus Christ. If that's the goal, what's standing in the way? What are the obstacles? What areas of your life are competing with Jesus for your devotion? Is it your time, your me time? Is it maybe your work? Do you drop everything when the office calls? whether you really have to or not. Is it your children? They must have every opportunity in life. And then with whatever's left over, we'll give that to church. Is is it your politics? Does it matter more to you that this person is a member of the EFF or the DA than that this person is a sister in Christ? Which matters more to you? When Paul is unpacking the goal of ministry for the Colossians in chapter 2, verse 1, this is what he says. I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. Why, Paul? Why? What, What end do you have in mind when you struggle? That your hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. Devotion to the King means that we are united in our love for him. It means that we would subvert all other claims to our allegiance. Everything else is secondary to our devotion to him. He wants total devotion, and when he has that, everything else will find its proper place. The goal of ministry is total devotion to Christ. If this sermon is feeling a bit like the Comrades Marathon, well, let me just give you an update. You are just hitting poly shorts, right? So on the up run, poly shorts, you've only got eight, eight Ks or so to go. Now, what is eight Ks when you've already run more than 80? So hang in there. Hang in there. Gilbert Mukudwani can tell you all about it. Sixth mark of ministry. The means of ministry. Chapter 1, verse 29. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Paul struggles, he labors, he toils, he suffers. But the energy to do it all is not his own. He is fueled by grace. You you read about the life of Paul in Acts, you read his letters, you can see here is a man who is fueled by the grace of God. He is fueled by the fact that Jesus has done everything that needs to be done to save him and bless him. All he can do as Paul, no longer Saul, all he can do is work out of that reality. Paul doesn't labor towards God's favor. He labors from God's favor. Paul doesn't toil towards God's love. He toils from God's love. God loved him and favored him freely when he deserved exactly the opposite. And so now, secure in all of that love and favor, he can give himself totally to the Lord Jesus in ministry. See how it works? His work is fueled by the grace of God, not the other way around. His work is fueled by the grace of God. And so should ours be. If Jesus is at the center, if we're going to have any hope of glory, if we're going to have any joy in the face of suffering now, any chance of living as servants, then our ministry has to be fueled by grace. 
we have to cling to the truth that ministry is God's work from start to finish. And we just have the privilege, the joy of sharing in that work. Finally, can I have a hallelujah? Finally, the reason. The reason Paul reminds the Colossians, the reason God reminds us that this is the nature of ministry is there for us in chapter 2, verse 4. I say this. Why do you say it, Paul? I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. The reason the Colossians needed to be reminded of the true nature of ministry was that there were so many alternatives. There were so many supplements to proclaiming Jesus, to having him at the center, and, and they were so plausible. So many alternative models of ministry. There were and there still are. And they are so plausible, so attractive to us. Yes, gospel preaching is important. But shouldn't we be putting more time and energy into social development, given all the needs around us? Healing ministries work. Those churches are full. Could we be missing a trick? Shouldn't we invest just a little bit more in putting on, you know, in a, in a bit, more sh bit, bit, bit more of a show, a bit more energy, a bit more vibe, just to keep things current and connected? You see, it all sounds so very plausible. It sounds so attractive. And it's not that any of those things are bad. It's just that they're not the center. They're not the heartbeat of ministry. They are not what God considers of first importance. The marks of ministry are a call to servanthood, a cost in suffering, the method of proclaiming Jesus Christ, the goal of devotion, the means of grace, the danger of alternatives, and at the center of it all, the saving lordship of Jesus Christ. I'll leave you with this question from chapter 2, verse 5. Just have a look at chapter 2, verse 5. And let's ask this question of ourselves. If Paul was writing to Christ Church Midrand, would he rejoice over us in our ministry? The answer I come to is a great comfort and a great challenge at the same time. Let's pray. Father, please, we plea with you. Help us to keep Jesus at the center of all that we are and all that we do, all that we say, every thought. Transform us into joyful, sacrificial servants for the sake of others and for your glory. Bless our ministry, we pray. Amen. Folks, really good to work through this wonderful letter with you. And um, I hope that during the course of the week, you'll have an opportunity to read over this passage again, to meditate on it, to pray through it. And uh, let's all be praying that God would galvanize us in our local church ministry here at Christchurch Midrand. God be with you. Go well. Have an excellent week.